Hello, this is Dr. Mark Baxter with Baxter Health Center. Thank you for joining me for this presentation on how to read food labels and make healthy choices while shopping. Uh, my intention is for this presentation to be very practical, give you a lot of how-tos so that you can do a much better job of choosing the foods you uh, put into your body. We're going to be developing a plan of attack for how to shop. We're going to talk about which aisles to avoid. We'll talk about how to read food labels and how to keep your children busy. For those of you who have children, it can be distracting, but it can also be a time of um, and an opportunity to use this time of shopping as a way of educating our children so that they'll be able to make healthy choices as they grow up as well. So in our plan of attack, we want to plan our menus. Know what you're going to eat and where. Uh, the number of dinners, lunches, snacks, and breakfasts. It helps to make the list by food type so that you're not going from one part of the store to another part of the store back and forth. And you don't want to go to the supermarket hungry. That's a real mistake. So that can be a challenge for those of us that shop after work, before dinner. We tend to be hungry. But when you're hungry, you tend to do a lot more impulse buying. So try to restrain yourself if that's the only time you can eat. This way of shopping is very different for some people. Typically, when men shop, they hunt. We, we use a list. It's very easy for us to do. We go out, we get what's on the list, we come home. When women shop, they tend to graze. They kind of window shop. They look at this, look at that. I know I'm making generalities here, but it tends to be a little more difficult for women to shop with a list, but that's really the most effective way, efficient way of shopping and it tends to avoid impulse buying as well. So do use a list. Um, plan for the number of dinners, lunches, snacks, and breakfasts. Make the list by types of food, and don't go to the market hungry. So you want to list the foods by food groups, vegetables or fruit uh, on one part of the list, then chicken, fish, and other meats because they're in a different part of the store. Rice, pasta, and beans, again, because they're in a different part of the store. Milk, cheese, yogurt, eggs and then canned and frozen items. Now this picture portrays a common store layout uh, with the fresh foods tending to be around the perimeter of the store. That's where the dairy, the meat, the fruits and vegetables are. Packaged and processed foods are in the center and impulse foods like candy bars and chips and stuff tend to be at the checkout counters. And what we want to do is shop primarily around the perimeter of the store and only water into the center of the store uh, for certain specific foods and then keep yourself blind when you're at the checkout counter so that you don't pick up any impulse foods. Now for selecting low fat foods, you want to select lean cuts of beef, pork, and lamb uh, because they have less saturated fat. Uh, the loig, loin, leg, and round of meats tend to be lean. And we really want to emphasize grass-fed beef, bison, lamb, and organic chicken. Uh, those have a lot higher quality of fats. So the fats in those foods are actually good for you instead of sticking with corn-fed beef. Uh, most of the fat in there is bad for you. So if that's the kind of meat you're buying, you want to get the lowest fat, whereas with grass-fed beef, bison, and lamb, you don't have to be as attentive to how much fat is in it because the fat that's in it is good, healthy, high-quality fat. Grass-fed beef and bison are a lot healthier than grain-fed meat. I know we're kind of brainwashed into thinking that corn-fed beef is the best. It's actually the worst for you. Uh, Grass-fed meat is much higher in the healthy omega-3 fatty acids, uh, the same types of oils as found in cold water wild fish. And if you want to read more about how healthy uh, grass-fed beef is, you can look at grassfedbeef.com and they have a lot more information there. Now good or select grades of meat has the least amount of fat. I know we're all programmed into buying prime. A prime tastes so good because it has the highest fat content, but that's not what's healthiest for you. Choice is in between good and prime. Leaner cuts are better when using moist cooking methods, so like with a pot covered you want to select well-trimmed cuts so you're not buying a lot of fat. And especially with ground 
meats, you want to select the lowest percent fat available. Something interesting with ground bison, it has half the amount of fat as the typical ground beef, and it tastes a lot better. It tastes like the best beef you could possibly buy. Most of my patients and friends, once they buy ground bison, they never have a hamburger made with beef again. From that time on, they buy ground bison. And you can find ground bison in usually one-pound prepackaged packages at regular grocery stores like Smith's, Vons, Albertsons, next to the ground beef. It's just about a buck a pound more than regular ground beef and so much better tasting and better for you. So I encourage you all to look for ground bison the next time you go to the store. When you shop for seafood, seafood has to be wild, not farm-raised. And most stores will label their seafood as either farm-raised or wild. If they don't label it, then I wouldn't trust any of it. Shop somewhere else. Uh, tilapia and trout are usually farm-raised. Uh, most shrimp is farm-raised. But there's a lot of good fish that's wild. Most salmon is farm-raised. Uh, so you want to make sure you get farm-raised. Uh, make, make sure you get wild salmon. Um, if you've ever tried Copper River salmon, it's just the ultimate. Do yourself a treat and uh, get Copper River salmon if you ever see it for sale at the store. Seafood is healthy. It's low fat. Your fin fish, cod, halibut, whitefish, flounder, snapper, and many others are very healthy for you. Shellfish, if it's wild, is really good. Crab is always wild, so is lobster. Shrimp is usually farm-raised, but you can find it wild as well. They used to think these shellfish were high cholesterol. Now they've found that they're high in the good cholesterol called HDL. So don't worry about the cholesterol in these foods. And you want to make sure that you buy your, your fish fresh and use it within one to two days. Now food labels is the next section we're going to be going over. They were designed to help protect us from consuming too much of the things we crave. We crave primarily fat, sugar, and salt. Our ancient environment was deficient in those three things, so we developed genes to make us crave those things we're most likely to be deficient in. Unfortunately, in today's environment, especially with prepared and processed foods, uh, those particular items, sugar, fat, and salt, are not deficient at all, so we wind up getting way too much. Unfortunately, we still haven't developed the genes to avoid those foods or to tell us when we've had enough. So be aware that most foods have too much sugar, fat, and salt, and that those are the things we really want to look, pay attention to very closely on the food label so that we minimize salt, sugar, and fat. Most food is engineered. There are food engineers that know exactly what the optimal ratio of sugar, fat, and salt is to make that food most irresistible. And most food manufacturers and restaurants employ food engineers to come up with their recipes to maximize their profit, not to enhance your health. Always keep that in mind. The fact that it looks so good means nothing about how good it is for you. For that reason, we have to engage in mindful eating, which means being really conscious, being fully attentive to what it is we're putting in our bodies. The vast majority of people eat reflexively, and in a very big way, they are unconscious because they're not really thinking about what they're eating. If it looks good, they stuff it in their face. So I encourage you to be as attentive as you can to what you're putting in your body. There's a lot of information about this engineering of foods in an excellent book by a former Surgeon General, David Kessler, in his book called The End of Overeating. I encourage you to uh, read more about that if you're interested. Now, as we read the food labels, we're going to see a nutrition facts panel where it goes over the serving size, calories per serving, the amount of key nutrients per serving, and the percent of each nutrient of a standard 2,000 calorie diet. There's going to be an ingredient list which lists fats, sugars and sugar substitutes, sodium and protein, and then they'll go for health claims as well. So here's the typical food label. You'll see the serving size is at the top. As you're comparing different foods of the same type, you want to make sure the serving size that you're comparing between those foods is the same. So if you're comparing two different jars of spaghetti sauce, for example, make sure that the serving size is the same number of ounces or grams. Otherwise, it's, it's difficult to compare them if their serving sizes are different. 
Then you want to take a look at how much fiber is in the food. Fiber is a good thing. You want to look at how much vitamins and minerals. Those are good generally. You want to take a look at the calories. Lower calorie tends to be better. It tends to be a reflection of less fat and less sugar. You want to look at fat, sodium, keep that to a minimum. Sugar should be kept as a minimum. And you want to take a look at the ingredients, which are usually listed in the order of how much of each is in the food. So the first item listed in the ingredients is usually the item that is most dominant in the food. There's more brown sugar in this particular food item than anything else. So take a look at the serving size, cups, ounces, grams, how many servings per container and the amounts per serving. We tend to crave fat, whether it's saturated or unfat, saturated doesn't matter to our cravings, but it does make a difference with our health. You want to absolutely stay away from shortening lard, palm oil, hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated oil. Those are very unhealthy for you and it takes months to get them out of the body once you've consumed them. Pay attention to the amount of sugar and salt in the item. Now take a look at the ingredient list here. You've got brown sugar cinnamon filling, which is composed of brown sugar, dextrose, which is another type of sugar, partially hydrogenated soybean oil. There's one of those partially hydrogenated oils we're talking about. They're poison. A little farther down, you'll see underlined another partially hydrogenated soybean oil. And then in the ingredient down at the bottom, they've reproduced the same ingredient list. It lists all the different sugars in there. There's brown sugar, dextrose, sugar, corn syrup, dextrose, high fructose corn syrup, all sugars. Not good. Here's a list of a bunch of different sugars. And you've probably seen most of these in the foods that you've eaten if you've been paying attention to ingredient lists. Are any of these healthy for you? Actually, no. Honey is a little less problematic because it's twice as sweet per unit weight. So you wind up consuming less of it because it tastes sweeter. But all these sugars upset your body's glycemic balance. And they push you toward diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and many other diseases. So no matter what sugar is in the food, even if it looks natural to you, like natural cane sugar or organic cane sugar or unrefined cane sugar syrup, it's all sugar. None of it's good for you. Now here's some sugar substitutes. There's aspartame, saccharin, acesulfane K, sucralose, sorbitol, xylitol, mannitol, and stevia. Which of these are healthy? Well, most of the ones up top are, uh, the, the three up top, are all converted into pesticide and herbicide in the body. They're neurotoxic. Sucralose is also an artificial sweetener. It's made from sugar, but they chlorinate it, and there's no chlorinated compound of any type that's good for you. However, they haven't found any bad things with this yet. Only approximately 2% of it is absorbed through the intestinal wall into your bloodstream, and that doesn't appear to change anything in the body. The rest of it, the other 90% passes right through the gut and is eliminated without even being absorbed. So that tends to be the least offensive of the artificial sweeteners, but I choose to not put that in my body. Sorbitol, xylitol, and mannitol are all called sugar alcohols. They are low glycemic. They turn into blood sugar slowly, so they don't upset your sugar balance. Of all three of those, xylitol is the best because it actually is good for oral health. It helps prevent gum disease. It actually helps cure gum disease. Be aware, though, that when a food says it has xylitol in it, it doesn't mean that's the only sweetener that's there. Most of the gums that boast that they have xylitol also have aspartame or saccharin or acesulfine K or sucralose. So you want to be using items that have just xylitol as a sweetener. Or on the bottom, you'll notice stevia. This is also known by different names, including Truvia and Reb A. This is a plant extract in the stevia plant. It's 200 times sweeter than sugar. It has a slight bitter taste to it that some people don't care for, but most people find it tastes just like sugar. So I encourage all of you to try stevia or Truvia. Truvia, I believe, is even available at Walmart. 
So it comes in individual packets, easy to use, convenient. You can carry it in your purse or your pocket. And it's a good way to get some sweet taste without uh, putting extra sugar in your body or harmful chemicals. Sodium it comes in a lot of different forms on food labels. There's sodium chloride, common table salt, sodium bicarbonate, disodium phosphate, sodium caseinate, MSD or monosodium glutamate, sodium sulfite, and nitrite. Each of these is bad in certain ways. Um, they all have extra sodium, and we tend to have too much sodium in our diet. Sodium nitrite, which is used along with sodium nitrate in curing meats, is actually neurotoxic. A good one to stay away from. It's poisonous to your brain and nervous system. And taking a look at our food label again, we see all the different instances of sodium in here. In one instance, they refer to it as salt. Another is baking soda. Another is sodium acid pyrophosphate. All contribute to the sodium load in your body, and that's not good. So is there such a thing as a healthy salt? Well, for years, I've been using a salt called real salt. Now, most people think of table salt as being sea salt, and sea salt should be healthy for us because it comes from the ocean. The ocean is natural. Uh, but most sea salt out there goes through a process called selective precipitation. What that means is they drain the ocean water into a big evaporation pond, and the first salt to precipitate out is sodium chloride. It's a nice pure white salt, and that's what they like to sell, is a nice pure white salt because it doesn't look dirty. And so they stop uh, making salt from the brine once all the sodium chloride precipitates out. Then they drain, they drain the rest of the brine out of the evaporation ponds back into the ocean. Well, the rest of the brine has all the other different minerals, approximately 70 of them. And it's those minerals that our body can use. So we're talking about minerals like calcium, magnesium, manganese, selenium, chromium, rubidium, all these other minerals, which our body needs in trace amounts, they drain those back into the ocean. And that's why regular sea salt only has sodium chloride in it, and that's what we want to avoid. Real salt comes from a salt deposit in the ancient inland seabed up in Utah. It's millions of years old. So there's no pollution in it at all, and it has 84% sodium chloride, but 16% other salts. So although you're getting some sodium chloride in there, it's the other salts that are beneficial for you. And what I found is that the salt tastes better, and you need less of it because you're getting what your body really craves. When it thinks it's craving salt, it's really craving these other minerals that regular table salt lacks, but real salt has. So you can use less salt when you use a better quality of salt that has less sodium chloride in it and all these other beneficial minerals. So an excellent natural way to supplement your diet with extra trace minerals. And it has some sodium chloride too, so you want to make sure you don't overdo it. Another option is to use something called concentrase, uh, which we carry here in the office also. And it's a liquid form of a product like real salt, except it's had most of the sodium chloride taken out of it. So one thing I use concentrates for is I, I drink distilled or reverse osmosis water and I add back the healthy minerals by adding concentrates to it. Now if you're, if you're making a, a dish for your family, it's easy to add a little concentrate liquid into the pot instead of regular salt or real salt. If you're salting your own food, it's difficult to use concentrates for it. It's, it's better to use real salt for salting your own plate of food at the table. But for cooking for the family, concentrates is an excellent way to do it. What are some other label terms? Well, we see free sugar, free of sugar, free of trans fats. And they like to boast that when they're free of something that's bad. Uh, they'll talk about reduced calorie, reduced sugar, reduced fat. They'll talk about low in certain things that are bad for us, so low fat, low sodium, low cholesterol, low calorie. But keep in mind that manufacturers manipulate these their serving sizes to fit the definitions. So there are several foods out there that, that used to be labeled honestly uh, that they had trans fats, but they lobbied the FDA to change the rules 
so that as long as they had less than a th certain threshold amount of trans fats, they could claim there were no trans fats. So they just lowered the serving size. So say a serving size of crackers might have been 12 crackers. And for that, they would have to indicate that there were trans fats on the label. They just lowered the serving size to four crackers. And in four crackers, there are still trans fats in it, but enough less that they can actually claim that there are no trans fats, even though there are trans fats. I know it can get confusing, but what I'm really coming down to is that you can't trust the food manufacturers in what they put on the label when they say no trans fats. It's just best to not eat foods that are processed, and then you don't have to worry about the trans fats. Now, these labels will also indicate when they're high in good things, high fiber, high protein, for example. And they'll say they're light in calories or light in fat. So healthy foods would tend to be low in fat, sugar and calories, and sodium, high in vitamins, minerals, protein, and fiber. How do you keep your children busy? Well, don't shop when your children are tired. Because uh, when they're tired, they can make the shopping experience pretty miserable. Keep them occupied with toys or books. And if possible, let them help you shop. Uh, when kids are a little older, they can learn about nutrition by helping read food labels. So one thing I did with my kids is I told them, okay, you can have any cereal you want as long as it has less than 10 grams of sugar per serving. So they'd learn to read the food labels. And at first I let them bring to the basket anything that had 10 grams of sugar per serving or less. And the next time we went shopping, I changed that to 7 grams of sugar. And the next time was 5 grams of sugar. And then down to 3 grams of sugar. Basically, when you're down to 3 grams of sugar, you can use wheat checks, rice checks, shredded wheat, rice krispies, or uh, grape nuts kind of limits it, uh, but that's a good way to help teach the kids about food labels. And you can do the same thing, not just with sugar, but with fiber, with fat, with calories. So it's a good opportunity for them. And then they can kind of get into it and learn about what you're doing. So in summary, when you go to the store to shop for groceries, be prepared. Have lists of your foods. Make sure they're categorized in the different food categories based on your planned menus. Uh, make sure you keep your children busy. Uh, coordinate your list with the store layout. Pay attention to food labels. Know what you're buying. Know what you're putting into your body. And by all means, try to not go to the store hungry. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. Look forward to our next webinar together. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.